What team are we doing? We're doing New York Excelsior. <laughs> oh, okay. We're going to do the New York Excelsior. And welcome to the 2021 team preview for the NYXL. So many comments, too many comments, actually, to count. Thousands of them. Millions. Right? My emails flooded mm. with the NYXL <laughs> fan base. Multiple Asking emails. For this Brand episode. TSA. <laughs> flooded. Flooded with it. And, uh, and now we're finally bringing it to you. The New York Excelsior team preview. Uh, it was a long time ago. I'm pretty sure that they announced a lot of the players coming in. Uh, yeah. How long yeah. ago was it? It's been mm. it's been months. I remember Three because months. Matt was talking about it every time on the end show. of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. The, like December the 20, 22nd of December, I think, was when we uh, when the players got announced. And it's been, I mean, it's like literally almost three months ago. Um, and we're finally getting around to it. Yeah. The NYXL rebuild. Also, Jaws is here, but that's not it. Jaws important. is here as well. Hi, Jaws. Hi, Jaws. Hi, Hi Jaws. Um, <laughs> Hello. We got Jaws here uh, because Matt, again, Silver Spoon motherfucker. I know. I'm Can't to swear. we say that we got Jaws because he's brilliant and like yeah, he's pretty well, and really get dragged smart? In. I mean, listen, at least, at least Jaws has an opinion of it. Uh, uh, like, uh, like iced coffee, you know, like fucking Matt. <laughs> you know what I mean? That is Matt. Uh, the amount of times I walk past his door and there's coffee sitting outside, I'll take a photo and send it to him and be like, by the way, coffee's outside, pal. You might want to pick it up. It might get stolen by I me. I thought he stopped ordering coffee. What? Why would you? What? what? He, he, told was, me. he was wasting so much money on coffee. Yeah, he, like, he did say that. I think it's only when he does broadcasts and stuff, like with COD. So. He told me that it was good for him, like, you know, staying indoors all the time because he wasn't spending as much money on coffee. Well, you just the, normally... The most... five coffee. I saw outside his house the other day, says otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, though, would have had something to say in this. New York is like the only team that Matt has opinions on in this offseason, actually. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I'm going to be the mouthpiece of Matt when we get into these, these topics, too. Sure. Because he lives in my head now. And every time I have a conversation with him about the NYXL, he brings up the same couple of topics. So I'm going to... I'm going I'm to be like the Matt sure. surrogate as well. Well, let me set the scene, the context then for this, because if you're just catching up on the Overwatch League for whatever reason, the MYXL, as you know, they've kind of had this roster, this core base roster, and they've kind of churned and added pieces, you know, over the course yeah. of the years. And now they've gone instead opting for almost an like entirely full rebuild with Jonak as like the centerpiece of what they're building around here, um, the most longstanding member of this team. Uh, and they've just built it with some players have been playing recently like ivy yeah. and bianca but um outside of that a lot of new police uh, new pieces as well some players also been in the overwatch league but a very risky venture all things considered if you look at a lot of these names may maybe not risky in terms of us questioning i think some of the individual abilities of some of these players but more the fact that whenever you're building a new team with new pieces outside pieces all together and you're bringing it all together you are taking risks with this team because there's always a chance that somehow it doesn't come together and they end up slipping down the rankings early on yeah. so i think that's where we start off honestly is just talking about big picture of this team and then i suppose we can go over the roles individually but if you got you want to start yeah i'd i'd like to kick it off as well with the whole concept that i saw actually yiska debating on twitter a couple of days ago as well is should this nyxl team be measured by the former franchise success of this squad. Or, or rather, not this squad, but the previous squad. Sure. And I think that's a really good place to start because New York have... They've, they've gone for a very different route this season. And here's, my, here's Mr. X speaking okay. via me, using me as a little puppet here. Because if Matt was here, Matt would be saying, you know what, Bren? I'm not going to do his accent, but you know what, Brent? I love this move. You knew what you were getting from the former New York squad, and they've retooled with fresh, new, hungry rookie players. And even if it, even if it doesn't work out this year, they're going to be able to have a new core for next year that they can continue building on. So mm -hmm. it's, it, the, the thing that Matt always brings up is that now was the right time to reboot the NYXL. Okay. You weren't getting a championship out of that previous roster. You knew what they were capable of, and it wasn't working out for them. They didn't look like they were going up and up over the years and getting closer and closer. If anything, they looked like they were getting further and further away uh, after their incredibly dominant 2018 season that slipped away from them. It just hasn't been the same since. They've been slowly going down the rankings. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm inclined to agree with him. I think that I think this was the right time 
to get rid of the prior roster. Okay. I don't think that that core was working out anymore, even though they were very talented players and might work elsewhere if you mixed up the pieces. And I also think that they've picked up some decent talent here. Do I, th do I think they're all going to work out this year? Statistically unlikely, right? Sure. Unlikely to instantly bang. But ceiling is very high. Mm -hmm. So, and, and especially if you figure out which pieces weren't quite working, if you come close next year, you've got a good chance. There's my little Mr. X talk. Thank finished. you. Wow. Yeah. And now Sideshow will return to the broadcast. Do you wanna, are you going to play devil's advocate for your own? No, no, I actually, <laughs> I actually do it. No, I, I mean, I, I'll carry on. I, I actually agree with you. Uh, and I agree with, uh, sorry, I agree with Matt. Yeah. Matt, yeah. that's a good point there. <laughs> uh, good point there. But I actually, uh, the, the point you uh, mentioned as well, that like they picked up the right pieces as well. I think we're seeing a lot of teams rebuild within the league and then they pick up some like questionable pieces and you're like, what, what's going on here? Like, should you really be like, putting money on that guy but i think overall new york is betting on a lot of good talent so maybe it is the case that you know there's going to be one or two players that don't work out and you'll have to rebuild come next year a little bit again but for the most part like we will get into the individual roles but for an example you look at the dps lineup with feather ivy flora and guangbu and it's like so at least two of those i like to say are gonna work out right and I mean, okay, Ivy is already a little bit proven, but like, statistically, I think more of these players will work out than people might give them credit for, uh, considering the talent that is on this roster. So I think they're doing a good rebuild at the right time with the correct players. And so, you know, things look good for the season. Also, I just they're like to point have out, the... uh, yeah, sorry, on, Josh, because this will help us all. If any motherfuckers in the comments right now talking about the NYXL shock leaked scrim, Get out. <laughs> yeah, just actually stop writing your comments now. If, you, if I see even a single comment being like, you, you saw what they were capable of. They beat NYXL. Shut up. Shut up. It's <laughs> nonsense. It's a scrim. Scrimbuck Express. Don't. Look at scrimbucks from, like, I mean, they're just decaying. But, but, but also, it's not scrimbucks. It's a single buck. It's they, <laughs> yeah. they found one example and it got leaked and then... It's okay, not even now, legal tender at this point. No, it's not legal it's tender. Not, it's, it's, it, they found it all in it? France. Do you think New York leaked it for like the clout? Just like, I would be shocking a scrim. Look at us, look at us go. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> self-leak. Who knows? That kind of stuff could happen. But, but I just, I want to preempt that because I've seen a lot of hype around New York and I think some of it is very deserved. But a lot of it is driven by that single leaked scrim that people have looked at. And I just want to temper expectations a little bit. When you look at scrims, when you look at even like preseason matches, matches, you're getting a snapshot of them at one point testing out one style, one, one single block of scrims. Don't read into it too much. Do not post that in the comments. Yours, please continue. I was going to say, yeah, I think you are right with the year of building. This is the high year. Better late than never, I suppose. But what was that? It was so fall over. Siri dropping like a bottle in the background, <laughs> but it got cut off on the, the chat. Won't I mean the people watching won't be able to see it? But it was comedic because it just well, it just <laughs> fell. Can you hear a pin drop? Yeah, it's raining in LA, so she has to do exercise. It is. It's kind of nice actually. Everything it's goes like really four or five green, days in two weeks. It's, it's crazy. It's sick, dude. I went on a walk yeah. the other day, saw some turtles, and there's the green everywhere because it's got uh, the plants have got one lick of water in the <laughs> yeah. past uh, 17 years, and now they're finally growing green. It feels good, man. Uh, anyway, crazy. back to the point. Was this is the year for rebuilding? But the problem, the problem is, that I think they're just going to get slapped around, man. Like it's going to be a, such a hard entrance for a lot of the rookie players, and I, I've kind of written down that. They're going to have to get taught by like this old guard. I think Flora, who's on the screen right now, I think he's one of the most promising uh, players to come onto the team, if not the most promising. It, I was casting a uh, contender's career back when he was on O2 Blast and they want to get to Runaway um, in the finals, which was a LAN final as well. Um, that was the year that they did take away LAN of like regular season and stuff. And Flora like always impressed me. But uh, looking at the APAC region currently, Dude, they they are in for the world of hurt, like for the almost the yeah. entire year, I feel, unless they just actually clap. It's gonna be next year when they actually 
find a ton of success, I think. I don't think people should pin a lot of their hopes on the fact that Jironex is still here and they've got people like Ivy because half the team is basically new. Um, but I am looking forward to it. I think Flora can really just clap cheeks in Overwatch League. I, I'm pretty excited. Yeah, they've got a lot of talent, but they also have a lot of inexperience. And I yes. think the combination of that means that you are... Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> got... the combination right, I'm going to talk. I'm it going to push the talk. It this often means that you have a really high ceiling that you could yeah. potentially reach, but you also might get rolled in like um, either the beginning of the season or you fail to adapt to a certain hero pool or a certain meta doesn't really vibe with your players or something. Uh, and for this team as well, considering that they only have... Yeah, I'm right in saying that, right? They only have a tank line and a support line. They don't have yeah. backups for either of those positions. Um, yep. So you are correct. It, it, it's not the DPS that worries me at all. You can have cracked out rookie DPS players and they will pound. I really don't doubt that in the slightest. Yeah. What, what concerns me a little is the inexperience at a high level of Friday and also the potential weakness of Yakpum Bianca across like against elite competition and against uh different matters different metas yeah, yeah as well and it's not like I I'm not going to put my finger on like a specific meta and say this is going to be bad for them it's more so the case that when you watch a lot of vods of these teams play and you've seen their success in contenders I, and I'm specifically here not talking about the DPS because I do think those are mega flexible a lot of it a lot of the success of these players comes from uh, getting very good at one individual meta when you see contenders play out. Contenders doesn't have hero pools. Contenders is, at the moment, the way it's formulated, is over a small period of time and a tight tournament kind of system. Um, if over the entire course of the Overwatch League, maybe it's less relevant this year considering you only have like 16 games, mm -hmm. but normally there is a larger swing in the meta, especially with hero pools coming in. And you you have to be able to perform unexpectedly. Like, playoffs hit, and suddenly everything changes in the game. How do these teams react to that? I don't know how NYXL's going to react. I think you're taking a lot of... Uh, it's a lot less of a known quantity because of the inexperience. Yeah. I, I mean... Oh, I think... Oh, uh, go oh, on, Brent. Oh, 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 no, nah, you go on. Okay. I was going to say, adding to that, thank you, Bren. Thank you, Brennan Hook. I think adding to that with uh, this meta that's currently kind of developing, I'd be very worried. I think having a almost permanent tank line and a permanent support line is extremely good. And I, you need the flexible DPS currently. But when it's stuff like Rush with Lucio Bab, uh, you're going to show cracks if you're a rookie. Like, obviously, we can... Um, we can count on Jonak, and MYXL can count on Jonak. But with Friday, like you, I feel like you're just going to get run over. And as well, like uh, with the tank line too, you're going to need to be playing this rush style, and it can be very easily. You can very easily get overwhelmed by extraordinary teams. So sorry, the, I mean it's just carnage happening sorry. at the desk. There's just sorry. bing bong boom <laughs> happening oh, coming right. out of his laptop as sorry. something something goes off. Yeah, I, I, think I, think, the I think the inexperience will show even greater in a meta that's something like Rush, like with the BAP, like, like BAP Lucio and uh, uh, Ryan's Aya, like oh, Ryan Diva, etc. Like uh, cracks will show even more. Like you're gonna have such a tough time. The epic region is so strong and they're going to have to get up to speed very quickly. Like you said, Josh, I agree. I don't think we need to worry about the DPS. Um, you can be a cracked out rookie and you, you need that flexibility. So having four DPS players, I think is pretty good right now. Maybe a little bit excessive with four, but you know, having more than two is extremely good. I, I worry for the backline more than anything. And that's not just on Jonak. I think I, I worry because of how important Batista and important Lucio are uh, with these style of rush comps that uh, we might be seeing. I, I, I feel a need to like defend New York here. <laughs> I, I, I agree that Rush might not be the, like their, their go-to. I mean, I was probably one of the biggest critics of Jakpung's Reinhardt in the second season of, of, the, of the Overwatch League. I just didn't like his Rhine play at all. I think it was pretty passive back then. Like he took a lot of uh, unnecessary damage, couldn't manage his shield, etc. At the same time, it's like it's been a bit since then. And in Overwatch, you can definitely improve rapidly. 
And I think you have to give him sort of like the benefit of the doubt from what he accomplished at O2 Blast. And like, you see this as a new chance for him to really get off to a good start in the Overwatch League. I don't think anyone's going to like forget um, his career at the Toronto Defiant. But at the same time, I feel like you sort of have to like look at this guy uh, uh, from a new perspective. And in that way, just give him the benefit of the doubt, see how he, you know, place with the team and like how has he improved in contenders etc and then i think that bianca as well while we haven't seen a ton i mean i i don't know it, it gets tough though i i am quite bullish on this team i would say i think there's a lot of good talent here but then as jaw said like you look at the rest of apac and you're like well Stand. can you really like stand up against like rio and krong or can uh yak uh, stand up against gushue and then you have like gesture and uh not michelle anymore uh to you and it's just yeah. like it's really stacked in apex so it's tough um but in general i think i'm quite excited about this talent uh more than anything yeah i i think the um I, i'd like to talk about the backline a little bit as well because i think friday is the kind of player where when you watch his vods and contenders you glean no information about how good he is at all. <laughs> yeah. because he, the guy was just on a team that was getting slapped around repeatedly and mistakes that you make at the main support level are so connected to mistakes that your team makes. And it is so hard for you to stand out when your team is underperforming. And it's really difficult from an outside perspective to judge whether he is making the mistake or his team is giving bad info, Oof, has a bad read yes. on what the game is, that kind of stuff. Yes. So, Especially when you're on Lucio. Yeah. Now... Does it fill me with a ton of confidence that Friday, Skewed, and Checkmate were all picked up from OZ Gaming, a team that got kind of plowed in contenders? I, I don't even know, really. When I look at that team, I'm not sure that any of those people were really the problem. Checkmate, I've seen some good stuff from. The backline seemed a bit all over the place, but I can see the way that uh, Skewed is getting used in the Gladiators just as like that secondary, mostly focused on Brig by the look of it, uh, flex support. So I, I kind of get that. The thing with Friday is, though, I just have no idea what his ceiling is. Like, the, yeah. there is a theory that he's a good player that was just kept down in a bad team. That happens all the time, by the way. And you just can't tell how good someone is because their team is bad. And you, you, you can't... You get hampered. Like, the, there's a ceiling that you hit based on your team's performance, and you just can't break through that. And then when you get on a better team, you can show how much better you are. That could happen. That could definitely happen. Or... They're using one main support that hasn't shown anything, and we're basing it all off the, um, the, the reputation of their coaches being able to select good talent from trials. Do it I feels really... a bit Joby esque, does it not? From Houston Outlaws? Yeah. yeah You're like, okay, yeah. good luck. <laughs> it, exactly. Yeah. And, that's, and that's what I come to is like, when it comes to Friday, I don't have an opinion on what I think he's going to do in Owl. It's just good luck, mate. Good luck. You're partnered with Jonak, who is a fantastic player, but still makes some really dumb decisions sometimes. When you, when you compare him to the other flex supports at the absolute elite tier, Jonak gets put in with a lot of them, but sometimes you watch his gameplay and he makes questionable decisions, or at least he did last year. He's probably not going to get pocketed as much as he did on the former NYXL team where they built their entire system around Jonak. And so I think this is also a bit of a development year for Jonak too, which is, can he flesh out the rest of his flex support um, yes. roles to the same level as his unbelievable Anna and Zenyatta? Can he, can he get the same success out of those, the other picks that he has to go to across the season? And can he be... Um, more self-sufficient in the back line without his team playing around him so much? And can he make the right decisions in a style that works like that? Can he be a more supportive flex support? Or, or are N N YXL going to fall into the same trap of just trying to play around him constantly? I, I feel like that would also be a mistake. I, I, that that is back, my worry too. This back line Jonak has a lot of concerns play. for me. Yeah. It's gonna, he, he might be in a situation where he will be playing overly aggressive or, or playing and acting like almost like the old of the NYXL roster, which would insta peel for Jonak, you know? Yeah. I think he, I, maybe you can make the argument he's probably one of the most pocketed players in, in the history of the game, right? 
Like, but I would wow. pocket him too. If you had a cracked out yeah. uh, support like that, oh boy, I'd be pocket. Uh, dude, if he was in my ranked game, I'd be hitting a mercy. I'd be just right clicking him in the entire day. You know, like that. That is how good he is as an individual player. Yeah, he definitely makes mistakes, but um, is he going to be able to almost rein it back and not play in such an aggressive style and not play um, and use his use his rookies uh, not as kind of like peeling and bait, but just use them to win the game rather than being, yeah, maybe a little bit more of a selfish player than uh, he's appeared to be recently. Uh, I'm sorry, appeared to be in general requiring lots of uh, pocket, but then also finding success because I don't think the rookies are going to be able to pocket him as much and like peel for him as much as uh, previous set and XL lineups. Do you not think they thought of this though when they picked up Friday? Because obviously I mean, main yeah. support is a very adaptive role and I feel like True. when it comes down to picking up, if you're only picking up one main support, Jonak probably has some input in like how he plays with this player and how they work as teammates, right? So, I mean, it's interesting to see where Jonak takes his play this year as well because I think that you know, with a lot of departures like Mono, for example, you know, how is Jonah going to adapt to that and how is he going to change from perhaps a bit like we talked about, a selfish player to maybe someone who, you know, gives the benefit to his DPS players in this case because you have talent there, right? So I think it's going to be interesting to see how Friday lends himself to Jonah's style, but also how Jonah adapts to the new team. The yeah, I think it also comes down a lot to the tanks as well, right? Like it's not yeah. just how the main support partner works with Jonah, but it's also the style of the team like if they want to be really aggressive and try and make space for their dps to farm that necessarily leaves the back line a little more undefended and re requires them to be you know, jonak to be very focused on empowering the rest of his team to succeed which is always something that nyxl failed at previously where they would always recruit new cracked rookie talent that people were really excited about i'm thinking flower at the very beginning of it <laughs> we're talking uh pine when the season first began and he popped off at the beginning aspect and then um uh who else i swear there was somebody else nene mandu uh, oh yes yeah i think uh nene and i i guess i was also thinking of haxal too but Haxal did actually integrate a little better into this team than the other one. Oh, who are you? That's the other player that who I was thinking you? of. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Sure. The who are you and Flower, I think, are the epitome examples of this. Um, but I think you could expand it a little bit to some of the others too, in that they had players that everyone knew were mechanically excellent, but they could just never integrate them into the system. And that came partly down to like the tendencies of their tanks. But I think... Also, it was just a vision of how the team played. And I, I like the idea that you've blown up the team to remove that vision, that there shouldn't be any holdovers from the prior squad anymore. They shouldn't play a passive reactive style. I'll be very surprised if they do. But now Jonak actually has to adapt because that style benefited him and he now has to play a different, a different role within the team. Yeah, I mean, they definitely need some time to just figure out what their style exactly is. I mean, if I came into a big organization, you know, like just hypothetically, imagine you're a player and you come into an organization. I think there is part of you that actually tries to like, simulate what you think of that team and how that team plays. So like if you go into New York Excelsior, are you going to try to play like the previous New York Excelsior players? Because you know what their style is, you know, they've been successful. Um, are we going to try to emulate that? Whereas I think it sometimes might be hard to just like tap into your own play style without having the bias of like what team you're playing for and historically how it's gone. You know, you're playing alongside Jonak, but in this case, like, are you just going to ignore the fact that you play alongside Jonak and just like, oh, I'm doing my my thing, Jonak. You know, just just do follow me, you know, play the way I want to, etc. Like, I think it's easily said and done. So I think this team needs a lot of time. But obviously, you know, that elite scrim was quite a while ago. So hopefully they've had time to like, refine their play style and have a good idea of one, what they want to do this season. Yeah, they've been playing together for a long time. That's the benefit of uh, of this season, actually, is that a yeah. lot of the teams should be really practiced coming into the league. Um, barring any teams that have had roster, uh, sorry, not roster, visa issues, which <clears throat> a couple of people are talking about, especially with like regards to Philadelphia. But for most teams, NYXL included here, they should have had a, quite a while to refine their game compared to, if we think back to 2018, 2019, even 2020, teams were rough at the beginning of the season, really rough, and they were still figuring stuff yeah. out. When, when you give enough time for all of the teams to scrim, the meta c tends to, um, to shrink a little bit in terms of what you can play. 
the players end up being a bit more refined because they've had more time to figure that meta out and find a role that really fits for them and find a, a style that really fits for them. So NYXL have that benefit going for them, even though they're inexperienced. I'm inclined to agree. With Thank what? You, well, with everything. A lot of points, <laughs> yeah. I think. The past 20 minutes. Uh, you, you brought up a lot of the points that I was, uh, that I kind of was thinking, which is, I think Johnny, your point about the DPS, the rookie DPS, probably not going to be the main problem of this. Like you're always going to have rookie, rookie DPS to pop off. Uh, I don't think that's going to be where, if there are any problems with this team, that's not where they're going to arise, but it's going to be in the limited tank line and support line. And yeah, I, I kind of concur with you. I was trying to watch the VODs, Josh. He linked mm. me. Oh, yeah. Uh, By the way, if you want to watch VODs of these players, you've got to delve into Billy Billy and um, Afrika yeah. because they don't exist anywhere else. I mean, it was literally impossible. Like, it, <laughs> it is so hard without the replay viewer to see the impact of a main support player. And for the same reasons you were saying, which is so much of the success of a main support player is tied to their team playing well and yeah. not making mistakes themselves. So I kind of foresee this, this support line Friday going to be probably fulfilling a similar role to something like Animo did in this team previously. Uh, and where I, I don't really know where the New York Excelsior are going to be setting their, their expectations regarding success this season, but I think they might be on a similar trajectory as like when the Florida Mayhem did one of their first rebuilds. You know what I mean? And you're getting, Is this Quang Boom? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I could tell. From they, the so he, he could, he is he could tell. His, his flicky aim is just like so... It's yeah. crazy I, I see that aim and i'm just like wow that's going boom um sorry brian i just interrupted you because no, this guy's a freak he, yeah he is he's an absolute freak but this, this is what i mean they, they've got the cover the base is covered when it comes to the dps line but when it comes to the tank line yakpun's kind of had a similar a similar th thing where he's gone back into contenders off the back of his poor performance on the toronto defiant and now he's going to be expected to hang with a lot of the overwatch league tank lines again after kind of having this hiatus period where he's again just, just trying to get back into the it's game. It's a little like himself. Fearless's story, but I, I don't. Suppose. Th it is kind of like Fearless, yeah, uh, to to an extent. But I think Fearless had more success in contenders than Yakpun did. Yakpun's had some some moments, yeah. But generally speaking, it's been a bit up and a bit down. Well, I think Fearless had more success before the Overwatch League than Yakpun did, right? I think that's a key distinction. Fearless was fantastic before he went into Owl, joined a terrible team. And then went back to contenders and started pounding again. Yeah. Uh, and then has come back to Owl and, and dominated. Whereas Yakpung was a decent pickup when he signed to Toronto. But he was, I mean, I don't think it was a top three pickup that came out of that season no. when it came to main tank. And then he's gone into Owl, underperformed, gone back into contenders and done pretty well. But he wasn't, again, he wasn't the best main tank in contenders. You know, you'd have Mag, you'd have Muse, you'd have Gaga. You you might have people like Hardy ahead of yeah, him as yeah. well. Um, so I, so yeah, I think there's so that's ooh, so that's where ooh, I feel now like we're getting to the spice. Woo! Well, this is where I feel yeah, like the, Hardy. I mean, yeah, I, I think that that is a, an interesting debate even there. Like, I, I think that. I think Yakpung should be considered on that kind of level, honestly, where he's coming back into the league proving himself again. He, he does have a lot to prove. And I, I don't think that he's at the same elite caliber from watching his games as, as people like Mag and Muse and Gaga. And then I'm trying to think of who the next best rookie was and how he came to mind, but maybe I'm forgetting somebody else. Who are the other rookie main tanks that are coming in this year? Oh, God. You're looking at me, huh? I mean, I'm in trying that, to... In that level... Uh, I'm mean, just trying to think tough. of any rookie main tanks that are coming in this year. I Who mean, obviously, you have yeah, Paris just no, bringing a ton, right? But I don't oh, think right. they're yeah, comparable, Dan, right? So, but I would have Hadi above Dan. Dan so exactly. So it's like you can't. I'm trying throw to think like who there. the fourth best rookie main tank would be. But I think it's between like Yakpun and and Hadi. But I don't know. Like I've been, I was, I was more impressed watching Hadi. But I guess there is like a skill diff in the regions, to be honest, which you can. You can argue about is Korean contenders much higher skill than uh, NA or EU in the most recent examples. Yeah, potentially, but I think that you know. Whereas, yeah, I I think that that's the kind of level that you should be expecting Yakpung to be at, where he's he's maybe like contesting people like Rio, but 
I think that it's going to be hard for them to be able to put up that level of consistent performance across the entirety of his skill set. Like at Yakpung's best, it's like Rio's norm. And then he doesn't have the same depth across. Yeah. I mean, part of that is, is definitely just like having played with a team as well and having that team chemistry, you know? Yes. Like I got to support my boys. Just like we talked about main supports and, you know, it's hard to tell how much impact a main support has. You know, sometimes main tanks, you know, they got the brunt of the uh, the bad looks from the kill feed. You know what I'm saying? If they got a bad yeah. team with them. So uh, Hardy definitely has that going for him, right? Where he has an te established team behind him and uh, a great off tank to play with him. Yeah. So uh, it, it's a bit harder for Yakpung in that regard because this is a new team. Um, but as we said, they have practiced for quite some time. So hopefully it looks good come regular season. I'd, I'd like to get on to the good side of NYXL, though. Because oh. so far we've just talked about, you know, where the issues could be with this team and why we're not the highest on them. Um, but if you want to talk about the good side, pick any of their DPS. I mean, mm -hmm. we've just watched Guangbu, yeah. so I guess we could get into him. It, it, this, the, it gives me... What a freak of nature. It gives me Ants vibes, but yeah. not... But but the thing is, Ants was such an exceptional talent. The Guangboon probably isn't going to be Ants, but you get no, those kind honestly, of vibes. It is a bit Pine-esque, you know? I, I don't think it's too far away from Pine. Mm. Do, do you not think so? Yeah, I mean, the style off, that like... he plays, yeah. Sure, yeah, but I mean, that, you know, that has its limitations as well, you know? Like, can you find consistency playing with that kind of, like, style i mean we've seen it time and time again how like when you have that kind of flicky aim how it doesn't bring the consistency required when you get to the top level in these later overwatch years when teams have established the team play etc like it worked early on for taimu then we had pine who obviously had his run of success but even like we've looked back in the vods and etc and like it, it just the game doesn't function the same way so like yeah. I agree. Is Guangboon going to come in here and just like revolutionize the game with his aim? It's like, I think it's harder to pull that off. And Bren has always been this guy who's been like, you know, it's you, you don't have the same impact as a great hit scan player anymore because yeah. of how well the supports and the tanks and all everything around you work as a Every team these days, right? So infinitely better. Like those kind of flick yeah. aim shots and stuff, like the nutty shots, we'll probably still get a few of them, but not as much as you're going to see in like solo queue where people are just. You know, they got one hand over one eye, and then the other, the other hands on their keyboard, which is on the floor, and then their foot is on their <laughs> mouse. You know what I mean? Like, you're you're never gonna find the the same level of uh, coordination and positioning and whatnot. Maybe the highest echelons of uh, Korean solo queue, maybe especially with all the pros back, but um, it's just not gonna happen. And but even in contenders, I think, I think Guangboom was pretty pretty damn consistent. You know? Yeah, like he sure. was still able to yeah, find a lot of value. You're never gonna find. I think you're we're rewarded a lot more on like the uh, the patience aspect as the Widowmaker and finding like interesting ways and different ways to actually enter a fight and start a fight too. And it's more about like catching people off guard than just like uh, going for these ridiculous kind of uh, yes, flick yeah, yeah. shots and stuff, you know, or but, like, when you're sitting in the front line behind a shield or something, you know what I mean? Like off on an angle because people are going to, the amount of overwatch that has been played from since here, since like apex and stuff. Yeah. Like you said, Johnny, the game has evolved so much that, it's almost hard to call it the same game. So, yeah, I think you are rewarded more with patience as a Widowmaker and just being not in, in general. Game, but... Sure, yeah, but I mean, there's also a reason why we're sitting here like gushing over Guangboon's highlight reel is because we do think that he is good monster. and I can bring that. Yeah, uh, yeah and he is yeah, really he is nothing monster. like that. And I think it's good that they have four DPS players now because you can try out all the four different styles and like what they bring to the table. And I definitely think that Guangboon can provide something that maybe the other three can't you know especially when it comes to heroes of course but even when it comes to aim and play style and stuff like that because he will bring a different play style um compared to say flora for example right so yeah definitely i i so i i, I think that's a good thing for the new york excelsior so i'm not here like it, it deserves to be mentioned that we think highly of guangboon and are curious to see how he performs uh, with yeah, that yeah, in mind. Yeah. yeah it's uh the the thing is you he was extremely impressive in what he's shown so far and translating that into the Overwatch League is now just the next step. And it's hard exactly, to know yeah. exactly how people do that. Some do insanely well, like Ants, but yeah. others have really failed to be able to do that over a significant period of time. I mean, most of the examples are no longer in the league because they just phased out. They were just the kind of players that weren't able to get that success consistently. Um, but I, I do feel pretty good about Guangbu. Like I said, it gives me a little bit of the, like the, 
the Ants vibes. I'm not meaning in terms yeah. of the way that he uh, that Ants played so many different roles uh, for the Shock. I think that that was just a massive credit to their coaching system and how smart Ants was as a player. But like when he first came into the the scene and was just popping heads, that I think is what you can expect from Guang Boon. All right. I yeah, about sorry, the yeah, DPS I, players. I, I, I've been distracted. Um, inexcusable. But yeah, I, I think when you're looking at hitscan players coming into the league, um, even if the talent that is scouted, even if the people that are scouting them, right, typically you find that some players get picked up and they're hit or miss. They're usually in the tank role or the support role. The one thing that's undeniable is raw mechanical ability coming from DPS players. That is talent that you can... You can look for pretty easily. Yeah, you can spot it. And you can spot simple. it pretty easily. It doesn't require pretty much any measure of skill. It's the reason why, you know, those roles are, are you know, to get so hyped up is because it's very easy to spot that kind of raw ability coming forwards. So, yeah, I'm not going to get onto the, to the negatives of where this team failed because I think we've covered that pretty in depth. But the DPS is really, I completely agree with you, where we should be gushing over. Secondly, Feather as an individual, mm -hmm. we haven't really spoke about that much. No. But this guy is unreal. Genuinely speaking, he is absolutely sick at his role. Uh, I, I think that having DPS to cover a lot of bases, I've got a bit of an issue with the lack of flexibility when it comes to their support and tank line. But the one thing that I think teams have learned off of last year with Hero Pools is that you need a thick, meaty lineup for the <laughs> DPS. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got you got to you got to get a, a wide berth of players because. If you get caught in a hero pool where, you know, for example, like this very specific niche selection of heroes end up getting taken out for like the, the what is it, the second tournament or the fourth tournament? Yeah, yeah, both. You need somebody to be able to cover what the new meta becomes. And we saw so many times from certain teams where they would just fall off. If one tournament, they'd be incredible. The next, fall off the face of the earth. Yeah. Because generally yeah. speaking, a tank player... They're not, they might not excel at every single role, but they can probably play every main tank. There's not that many of them in the game, quote-unquote main tanks. They can generally play most of them up to an acceptable level if you can play one up to a very high level. So that becomes less of an issue. But with DPS, there's such a wide cast available in the game to actually play. If you have somebody who can't play whatever's meta at the time, that's where you're going to be running into issues this year. And teams have recognized that. NYXL have recognized that. And they've shored up their defenses with these pickups overall. They've got the hit scan covered. They've got Ivy. Ivy plays a lot of very Ivy niche plays stuff. A lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot of very niche stuff. And was honestly, it has been some of, the, some of the shining spots of the rosters that he's been on in the past, actually, in specific metas. But Fever is the one that I'm quite excited for. Now, a lot of the footage I've seen of him has been of Echo, because it's been most recently the most meta pick. But, I mean, <laughs> I think Echo is a good example of something that if you can play Echo, you can probably play a lot of other heroes as well, up to a reasonably high level. Yeah, It's just yeah. kind of the base requirement of, of that hero. So, I'm quite excited off of the DPS for NYXL, and I think that's where they're going to be finding a lot of their success this season. Yeah, I, I think that the combination of Feather and Ivy allows you to play a shit ton of stuff. Um, yeah. It's it's a little bit different to having like Hisu and Ivy from last year, where Hisu picked up a ton of the, the long-range hitscan and the Sombra. You've got Feather that plays the Sombra and a bit of the Tracer as well, and then also plays a range of the projectile uh, heroes for you on the team. Um, I, I think that they should be able to cover everything. I don't think that there's a single combination I can think of where they should be struggling with Guangboon, Ivy, Feather, and Flora. They should have everything covered. And it's like, even the, even the other players that they have there, Ivy, Feather, and Flora, if you want to kind of put Guangboon on his own as like the long-range hit scan, that's what he's going to specialize in over the course of the season. The other three play a large, a, a large gambit of, of heroes. And it's not... They don't neatly fit into any one pool like people love saying they play projectile heroes they play hit scan heroes yeah, these guys are actually really, yeah. pretty pretty versatile it feels like a lot of yeah. the rookie players uh coming out of contenders have been forced to be more versatile than usual um in recent metas because you've had such a blend of double hit scan and and multi projectile roles yeah for sure did you talk about flora and what he brings to the table because he's a bit of a mystery to me I tried to do my due diligence with research, etc. Uh, but was it you, Jaws, that saw that you were hyped on Florida? 
Yeah, I'm pretty hyped on Flora. It's from yeah, I, I the footage I've watched of him is it's been the role I didn't th I didn't think the role that he was playing did him justice because he was playing a lot of Sombra was from what I was yeah, watching. Yeah, that, but I know he's a lot more flexible was... than that. And Sombra is something yeah. that you can you basically you can live or die by your team in certain you know in some situations. I think as well Feather or Flora could pick that up depending on what the meta is and whether you have to flex to yeah. something else. Didn't and Ivy so, play it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, Hisu played it. Hisu, Hisu played, played it. Yeah. That's right. So yeah. uh, that's not something Ivy that I think you should sure, struggle it, it, but, with either. But outside of that fact, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the, the DPS is where a lot of my hope is going to be placed with this roster and doing well this year. Um, and yeah. I think that's where, if you're a fan of the MYXL, that's also where you're going to be looking for success as well. Um, and as much as we've been talking down on the tank line, the support line, it's the way the Overwatch League is going to be working, I guess, is that you're going to have these long periods of time where it probably will be a singular meta and there's less games this season. I, I feel like if you do end up finding yourself maybe struggling, if, if the MYXL, I don't know, four weeks in, might find themselves struggling with specific meta, there's no reason why you can't just pick up some outside talent. Uh, I don't know what outside talent they could actually pick up at this point. It's it's pretty. I'm not going to say bare bones, but there Jay are Bossy. options. There are absolutely options out there in contenders that you can look into for yeah, to shore I mean, up the rest of your. It roster. depends what would fail, and it's incredibly difficult to tell at this point what would fail. I think the reason yeah. that we're not gushing about New York, even though their DPS looks fantastic and very well rounded and unlikely to fail, is just because when you have this level of inexperience something is likely to go wrong. But mm -hmm. we don't know exactly what. Well, you know, I will say this. There's different, different theories. Good news is that most of APAC is also retooling in yes. a similar situation. Uh, so, there are a lot of other teams in APAC that could crumble. Some that look like they are as uh, I mean, you guarantee at least one free out. win. Yeah, you really yeah, are. If, you, if you're in APAC, you're kind of gifted with it um, off, the, off the nature of just uh, Valiant just not having their shit together. So Let's see their roster before we, you know. Well, I mean, get okay. to it. yeah, I mean, we'll see the roster first before I'm making claims like this. But listen, yeah, the, the the writing is on the wall. It seems that. like it. Yeah, it, so it is I'm, most definitely on the I'm wall. I'm expecting it to be essentially. If you're an APAC, it's yeah. It, you you essentially just need to be the one team that is retooling with experiments, like with, with these all these new rookie players that ends up doing better than average than the rest of the other other teams. Which, I mean, it can happen. You what know? does NYXL's stage one look like? If are we uh, able to look could, at their schedule know, for... Um, we have it? Oh, here we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there you go. So they play... This is pretty hard, in my opinion. That's their first uh, four weeks. Oh, that's winnable. Winnable. Like, the first four games, sorry, as well. It's pretty difficult, though. Uh, this is extraordinarily difficult. difficult. But... Well, I yeah. mean, yes, but like, if you consider... <laughs> If you consider, like, the worst-case scenario for, like, Chengdu or a Hangzhou, you know, figuring out what they got going on, Seoul Dynasty, you know, like, maybe you could scrub two wins off the floor right there, you know? Like, if you scrub really hard. Uh, I don't know. Right, and that's... Uh, especially with unproven talent. That, I don't think it's possible. That's, that's what it comes down to, is your belief in, like, the assessment of the other teams in the region, I think. Because yeah. teams like Chengdu and Hangzhou, we haven't done the previews for them yet, but... They have ridiculous amounts of talent on their team. And it's They have a lot of upside. Yeah. I mean, the ceilings for all of the APAC teams are ridiculously high. Mm -hmm. But they've also done a lot of changes in the season, both Hangzhou and Chengdu. Um, and they're in a similar position to New York, where sure. some stuff could go wrong for them because they're making drastic changes. They haven't rebuilt their entire roster the same that NYXL has, but... And New York could still be a really good team this season, and they could still really struggle in APAC. It depends. So much of it comes down to whether the risks that these GMs and coaches have taken actually pay off. And because they're risks, they just have a chance of not working. And it's so hard to tell which of those will work and which of them won't. I mean, you could look at this first four game spree for New York and predict zero and four, and I think... You could be justified. If you just looked at each yeah. one, you mm -hmm. might consider New York to be the underdogs. But that isn't likely to happen, I don't think. APAC in the past has been extremely competitive, and I think it's more likely... Volatile as well. It's, yeah, it's more likely there's a little bit more volatility and competitiveness, and they end up one and three, two and two, something more in that aspect. Yeah. But, but it's so <clears throat> hard to predict this far out when we haven't seen the rosters actually play. Don't know the meta either. That... 
it's really difficult to place where New York could be, even if you even if you really have faith in their roster, you actually have to have anti-faith in other rosters as well yeah. to predict them let's, doing well. Let's frame it in a different direction then and, and I guess talk about our overall expectations for this team, where we think they should be placed in an APAC. Because I think with this roster being retooled, if Matt was here, he'd be saying like, you know, this is the first year, you see the results and you build upon it for the next year. And that's kind of his perspective, I imagine. I think that's what he's always said for NYXL is that that's what you want to be looking for. I think if this team ends up kind of like top of the middle pack, APAC, that is an outstanding success, in my yeah. opinion. Did you say top of APAC? Top, top of, of the, the middle, middle of the pack. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, Sorry. how many teams are there in APAC? There's eight. Eight. So, yeah. so if they like end up fourth, like in the top had... fourth, if they end up fourth, I Some think that like... is a, a resounding success. Yeah, that's, that's a really um, good success. Because, again, the odds are stacked against them with the kind of decisions that they've made to try and build this oh, roster. Man. They haven't gone for star pieces. They've got Jonak, but again, you guys have brought up your issues with Jonak in terms of what he needs to fix overall for this season. I, that's, this is my opinion. Looking at this overall roster, if this team ended finish it up fourth in APAC, I mean, I think you've got to be pretty chuffed at that as an NYXL definitely, fan. Definitely. Yeah. And I think the I expectations should around, be around that level say. as well. Yeah, I, sure. I don't know about expecting fourth. It's kind of hard to say that. But I do think that with the level of volatility that could be present in APAC, like some of the teams will inevitably shit the bed. We just yeah. don't know which ones yet. Um, being able to make at least one of these tournament brackets, where I believe you have to finish in the top four in a, in a stage, right? In order to make it to the, uh, to the tournaments in APAC. Isn't it... You yeah the upper half so like if you're yeah. top four you play a game to be the top two and then you qualify for Hawaii I think yes yeah yeah so Hawaii. I think I think NYXL, well, I, mean, I call it Hawaii but I love yeah. it though I have like Hawaii. Hawaii yeah I think that's that's a great point though I, I but that is what I think the goal should be for New York is that they have at least one point during the season where they crack into top four and look like they're dangerous in a tournament uh, that I think is a success for them. If they look like they have a chance of like winning a tournament, that's wildly beyond people's expectations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would be that would be fantastic. And if they get a meta where they can just let their DPS dominate, they actually have better DPS lineups than some of the other APAC teams that are rated really highly. Like, okay, Shanghai, fair enough, they're they're ridiculous. But when if when you start comparing like a them double sniper, mate. What? I think I think this team could pound in double sniper. Sure, yeah, absolutely. They want a meta shift really badly. They do not want to play rush. Yeah, they yeah. they yeah. they want to be I playing stuff that allows their DPS to shine. And if you get a meta like that, it is possible that they could make a, a, a semi-finals appearance or even possibly a finals appearance. But I think the general consistency for this team is going to be more around like fourth, fifth place in the region. Maybe yeah. maybe more like yeah. if they do get a finals play. appearance. Uh, wow like that yes. that that would just be insane for the team just as a whole and obviously insane for the fans too i i definitely put them like fifth sixth as like a, a, yeah. a ranking I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned as well that some nyxl fans are probably listening to this and this wasn't what they were expecting i guess what they I thought would be higher yeah i don't know where people's uh, here's the thing i don't know where people's expectations i have someone are called nyxl team. fan dude that keeps coming into my chat yeah as he gives me a daily reminder whenever i stream that guang boon is cracked yep. which i, oh, I appreciate that's that nice. i mean that is that is a, a good yeah. thing to always keep in your mind and then he i he, mean he keeps telling me that nyxl could have the best dps line in the league and in the uh, league that I mean, is too far. For that me. is too that's far. A, that's, <laughs> but uh, we're stretching to Mars. This is what I mean. There, the but... enthusiasm of it, of New York fans is unmatched. I feel in yeah, some cases. That is but true. I, I also think that this year actually might be a more exciting year for New York fans than previously. Because previously, there's potential. Previously, your expectations yeah. were, God damn it, we have the best team in the league. They just can't win. That was like the. I felt like that was the theme of New York fans. We know they're incredible. They dominated 2018, but they just can't get their shit together and actually win. They're stuck in a rut. They're stuck in their old old ways. Uh, they're just not doing anything. And I feel like that frustration is now going to be released. And instead, it's excitement mm -hmm. about new talent. Sure. It's it, you're getting into a game and Guang Boon's popping off and Flora's popping off and you've got Ivy going all over the place and and you. 
you're invested in the stories of Friday and Yakpung and Bianca to, to get better and better as the season goes on. Yeah. I think those kind of, the narrative for New York this year is extremely exciting. Whereas previously, if they had just kept the same core in this year, you knew what you were getting and it was still probably going to be like fourth in APAC, to be honest. Yeah. Like it wasn't going to be This has that much way better. more volatility and it can go either one way really hard or one way but, pretty hard Yeah, too. there's a difference That's what's though. That's most exciting. I, I'm like, when we compare, when we talk about the volatility in the league, we've, we've done some teams already and we've spoken about how it's high risk, high reward. A team like Houston, for example. I don't get the same feeling that I do with this New York Excelsior that I do with Houston because... I think of, New York different would reasons. probably batter Houston. Yeah, yeah head -head. and it's, well, yeah. I, but I, the, the thing is, when I say they're volatile, I think New York have a really high ceiling, like higher than a lot of the sure. other teams that we're going to talk yeah. about as being volatile. There's, okay, but yeah. they're just inexperienced, so they, they could end up being pretty average or, or below average, but the problem is that APAC is so competitive that they're going to kind of get dragged down the table a bit, but they're yeah. still going to be a decent team. Like, even if the worst-case scenario happens, I think this is still going to be an all-right squad. It's just that APAC is so competitive, yeah. their win rate isn't going to reflect that. Worst-case scenario, it is like Toronto Defiant of 2019. That's like worst-case scenario. I think if this... Yeah. I think you're really happy as a New York fan if you get into, like, Stage 2, and I think their matchups in Stage 2 are, like... Uh, Guangzhou, Philly, Valiant, and uh, there's another Seoul. Did I say Seoul? I don't know. There's like four pretty winnable teams there. Yeah, that's pretty like, good. Yeah, it's like it's definitely doable. And I think if you get away from this part, <laughs> if you get away from uh, a rush meta and you actually get to see some of your damage players like really shine, I think in stage two you got some winnable matchups. And if you start to see some of this potential really come to life, if you see some, like some electric performances from like Guangboong, Feather, uh, Ivy, if you start to see some of these players really, really flourish, I think that's, that's a good precedent for the rest of the regular season. So I think it, going into stage one, I'd have pretty, have pretty tempered expectations of this team because of matchups, it's a new team, rookie talent. But if you can really come alive in stage two, I think that feeling, especially because of their inexperience, you know, uh, this is a young team. I, I shouldn't say inexperience because they have actually some players who have played it out, right? But they have so much young talent here that if they can get going and like feel good about themselves and feel competitive, that drive, I think, is going to lead to them having an even better second half of the regular season. So I really hope that come stage two, that this team really comes alive because that's when we're able to see the best from New York Excelsior this season. And I think because of the talent on this roster, if they come alive, that's going to be a very entertaining team to watch in the APEC region. Mm -hmm. All right. We are, yeah. We've been talking around in circles, I think, a lot of the time as well, as we've got to the talent. Is there a final point? Was it? Nope. No? Okay. Should we do our weird little rankings, just to top it off at the end? Yeah, let's do it. Our weird little rankings. I mean, we've already kind of said where we would expect this team to place in APAC, but I would give this team <laughs> the God, upward would, potential of a... <laughs> of, I think of a B rank. That would be the, the highest potential. In APAC? It, B in Remember, APAC. S is a rank. S is a rank. Well, Remember, S is a rank. Yeah, a rank. A is a rank. No, but like, yeah, you're comparing to the rest of APAC with Hangzhou, Chengdu, Guangzhou, saying, Philly, where, and where you're where saying you B. It? Right, but, but B, this is what I'm saying. The highest I potential of this team is a B, which is in like the bottom... Highest bottom potential? Top, bottom top okay, quarter. Okay, the highest I, potential of London is like A. Fucking hell. I mean, I just... Okay. <laughs> um, uh, whatever. What, 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 what letter would you like to attribute to, to this New York roster? I think if you look at the rest of APAC and look, you look at this roster, yeah, we can gush about all the talent and potential this team has, but realistically, from their starting point, they're probably more like a C. C? Yeah, compared to the rest of APAC. S A B C D E. 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 F. F. No, there's no, no. no we don't, no, we're not no, doing no, that. No, but you, no. you think they're like down here. I'm like thinking the upward potential. I think their starting point is, like, is down there. Yeah. And I think they have talent. Okay. But I think but when you look at Chengdu, Hangzhou, Guangzhou, Philly. Yeah. I mean, Valiant this is like the only like D team in this region. Or, uh, but this sorry, is why I like say. Valiant is like E. That's why I, I say the upward, we'll upward potential. That's the. It's the key word. Is, yeah. Are we all brushing over this point that I'm making? No, no, I, you can't rank all the teams by potential. But, but I even uh, think that that scenario. is... Uh, it doesn't work. I even Give me a letter. Is, so Give me a letter. I'm going to go with... I'm going to... 
Our rankings for every other team has been based on the overall standings. So I'm not going to rank them based on APAC. I'm going to rank them based on overall right, standings. On. And I think oh, is that true? Oh my Isn't it? God. Yeah, I think it is. I, I don't think so. Is it Fuck it? this system, dude. Man, this system. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the point of it, again, every episode I say, the point of it is for ambiguity. It's supposed to be ambiguous. We're not supposed to know what's going on. Right. The viewers aren't supposed to know what's going on. It's supposed to attribute some meaningless value so that at the end of all of this, we can say, fuck it, and start ranking them from 1 to 20. <laughs> give me a letter. C. Jaws, give me a letter. C plus. Johnny. I said C. Okay, thanks for watching the New York Excelsior team preview. We'll see you very soon for even more Overwatch content. Bye-bye.